Well, we're here to talk about the Trinity and the Gospel and how they relate to each other. And is the Trinity central to the Gospel? Um, there's some things we believe that may be important, but they're not central to the Gospel. Uh, the exact details leading up to the second coming of Christ, for example, that's a common area where Christians can disagree on that, and the gospel is not at stake in that. But if someone said to us, you know, I deny the Trinity, you affirm the Trinity, but we still have the gospel, we would say, no, the Trinity is a first-rank doctrine. Um, it's of central importance to the gospel. So what is it that makes it a first-rank doctrine? Why is it central to the gospel? If you think, stay with the atonement, you can't understand the love that God displays in the cross apart from the Trinity. You think of texts like John 3.16, you think of Romans 8, that really the, their understanding of the cross is built on the analogy where Abraham was willing to not withhold Isaac to demonstrate his love for God. The Father has not withheld his only begotten Son to offer him as a sacrifice for sin. So without the Trinity, you can't understand the love of God in giving a son on the cross. Mm -hmm. in, in connection with that, it, oftentimes the Trinity is presented as something that complicates our Christian sharing of the gospel because many non-Christians don't understand the Trinity and either articulate it as tritheism or modalism as some form. So for instance, when we're in, in having conversation with intelligent Muslim friends who, who believe that the Christian doctrine of the Trinity is idolatry and they, they understand it as a form of tritheism. Well, is that a liability for us when we're having conversation with our Muslim neighbors? I would say no, because the glory of the Christian God is because he is love triune. He did not require anything outside of himself in the created world mm -hmm. eternally to be love. Because as Richard of St. Victor said many, many hundreds of years ago, the Father is loving the Son, the Son is loving the Spirit, the Spirit the Father. Eternally, there is, a, there is an outgoing of love in the intra-Trinitarian life of God that does not require a created order for that expression. And therefore, God is not dependent upon the created order in order to express His love. Therefore, creation itself is the overflowing of God's love. But if you have a Unitarianism that says God is only one and is absolutely one, he is incapable of expressing any of his attributes, much, much less his love, without being dependent upon an external creation. So actually, the doctrine of the Trinity simplifies your apologetics and it highlights the superiority of the one true God. I think two other just quick areas we could mention. One would be Christian unity. You know, in John 17, Jesus prays that we would be one. Mm -hmm. And the pattern for that is, as the Father and I are one. Uh, it's the Trinitarian oneness that we are called into. And then the other would be mission. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. There's this uh, Trinitarian sort of uh, uh, impulse, um, momentum that we are, are caught up into as we try to bring the love of Christ into the world. And a simple way for just good Bible reading Christians to do that is to watch in the letters of the New Testament how the Apostle Paul and others will deploy the doctrine of the Trinity for the sake of the Christian life. So Ephesians 3, 14 to 19, where Paul will bow his knees to the Father and ask that by the power of the Spirit, Christ would dwell in our hearts by faith so that we may be filled up to all the fullness of God. And so the believer just works over that glorious Trinitarian statement in a very simple prayer of Scripture and starts thinking, how does this teach me how that Christianity can be boiled down to the doctrine of the Trinity, that we come to the Father through the Son by the help of the Holy Spirit?